Hello, this video, James Joyce, The People and Places in His Works, is comprised of audio and images from two lectures I made in Latvia in February of 2024. I was invited to Latvia by the Ambassador of Ireland to Latvia to give two lectures on James Joyce. I was hosted by the Latvian Society of Anthropologists, the National Library of Latvia and the University of Liepāja. The two lectures had common parts, some background on James Joyce, an overview, a bit of biography, a bit about what he wrote and where he wrote it. And then one was about places and one was about people in his works. Now, James Joyce is a very wide subject, so this is really only Although the video is long, it's a small aspect of James Joyce. It was a public lecture and the idea was that I would record myself with an audio mic and then combine them into one lecture. So one lecture was about the people in his works and one was about the place in his works. And I've combined them into this one video of a sort of combined lecture. The first lecture on the February 7th was James Joyce and the People in His Works and it was delivered in the National Library of Latvia in Riga. I'll show some images of the building here. It has a spectacular interior. It was, it was a really nice place to uh, give a lecture. The building was designed by Gunnar Burkitz who left Latvia as a young man and ended up working with Aero Saarinen in the United States. Had a very distinguished career, came back to design this building in Latvia in his later years. And it reminded me in lots of ways of Kevin Rochu left Ireland as a young man and went away to the United States uh, where ironically he worked alongside Gunnar Burkertz in Aero Saarinen's office and came back to Dublin to design the convention centre. I was fortunate enough to, to meet Kevin at the opening because he went to my high school and there was a reunion event for Kevin. So that was, it was really nice. That sort of tie-in meant, meant something to me. You'll probably see in this lecture, I like connections like that. On the February the 8th, I went to uh, the University of Leopayo where I gave a second lecture about James Joyce and the places in his works. And again, it's a brief overview. And also in these two lectures, I was talking a little bit about my various running projects in related to James Joyce. So it was kind of, tying all those things together, uh, well, loosely. When you're talking about James Joyce, you're bound to make errors. It is a complex subject that I do my best to try and simplify in Ulysses, in the library scene. Stephen Dedalus says, a man of genius makes no mistakes. His errors are volitional and are the portals of discovery. Well, that might work for a man of genius like James Joyce, but it won't work for me. So that's what the comments on YouTube are for. So if I've made any errors or whatever, comments are down below. When I made the video, I showed a lot of words. It's the nature of making a talk about James Joyce. There's a lot of words and a lot of quotes from books. And I put the references on the screen, knowing full well that people wouldn't be able to read them as we went along. But in making this video, people will be able to pause, stop, rewind, etc., and read any of the references so they can check it out in further detail if they want to. And again, in a video that's going to be about an hour long, there are parts some people will be interested in and parts you'll have no interest in. So there are chapter markers down below so you can kind of see what's going on, where and skip ahead as you wish. The start of each lecture was pretty much the same. I introduced myself. I'm head of design at Technological University Dublin. I like to think of it as chief of colouring in, sort of. Yeah, there's more to it than that, but that's how I like to think about it. And then I talked a little bit about my friends at Unthink who designed the uh, identity for my website. The endings were different. The first one was about people and ended with some people in Ireland that James Joyce knew well. And the one in Leopaya ended up with me running on uh, Leopaya Strand, which I really did enjoy. So the sound, you'll, you'll hear differences in the sound because one room was echoey and one room wasn't. But yeah, it's uh, all there. The most important part of this video for me is to thank uh, a number of people who were responsible for me having a wonderful week in Latvia. It was a huge honor. I'm going to apologize now if I pronounce people's names badly. I, I can mangle my way through English and that's about it. But yeah, it's important to give thanks to a lot of people. I'd firstly like to thank the Ambassador of Ireland to Latvia, Her Excellency Imer Friel, Deputy Head of Mission Chris Boyle, Public Diplomacy Officer Marta Lawrence and Yanis Trubax for making the trip uh, both memorable and uh, making me feel very relaxed the entire time. So firstly, thanks to all of those. It was a real treat to be in the National Library of Latvia. I was hosted by Victoria Pishakova, the advisor of international cooperation and Oleg Pishakovs, who was in the East Asian reading room. Victoria took me around an exhibition of Gunnar Burkitz at the end. It was really special and particularly to see the chair that he designed for his son, who I referenced in the lecture. So that was a real treat. I'd like to thank the Latvian Society of Anthropologists and the moderator Klaus Sedleniex for making me feel 
totally at home and at ease at the start of the lecture. The second lecture was hosted by the University of Liepaja in Liepaja. Liepaja is on the coast about three to four hours from Riga. I very much enjoyed running on Liepaja Strand and you'll see some images in this video. I would like to thank Anna Priedela, who is the Acting Dean in the Faculty of Humanities and Arts and Head of the Department at Art Research Laboratory. So thanks to everybody who uh, made this such a special event for me. I make regular videos about running and I made a video about running in Riga and in Liepaja. I ran a half marathon around Riga in the snow. I'd never been to Latvia before and don't have much experience running in snow, but I gave it a go. <laughs> and um, I really loved running on the beach in Liepaja. And I'll show, you'll see some extracts in, in the video here. I had started running in relation to James Joyce about 10 years ago. In the video, I kind of explain uh, how I might have come about it. It might make sense to somebody. I'm not entirely sure it makes sense to me, but I do it. And this year, I'm hoping to make more videos about uh, I turned James Joyce's four major works into half marathons, which I go through in this particular presentation. But I want to film that and to do that, I set up a YouTube channel about running to get better at running and to get better at filming. I've, I've reached a point where I can probably do it. So I'm going to do that. There'll be a link at the end to the video, at the end of this video, to the video of me running in Latvia. And I would encourage, much as I'm always encouraging people to come to Dublin and run around, yeah, I mean, Latvia is a really beautiful place to go to, but also to run around in. So let's uh, roll the video of the lectures. Thank you. Some friends of mine run a graphic design agency and I asked them to do an identity and, and I'll show you the previous one. What I like was all about movement. So I look at that and I think of rivers, I think of streets, I think of movement. And uh, all of those are important to me in there. Well, they're all there. And uh, this, as anybody knows, or who's seen pictures of Joyce, in fact, I have a picture of Joyce without glasses, but he was famous for wearing these little round glasses, which we'll, we'll come to, but that is the, largely the symbol they did. This strange picture is supposed to remind me to tell you that I don't know how much any of you know about James Joyce or how much anybody knows about Dublin. Some of you might be experts on Dublin. Some of you might be novices. Some of you might be experts on Joyce. I don't know. So I'm going to cast the net out real wide. And this was supposed to be a picture of a net. It's a picture of a, f a fishing trawlers and hoax, but there's no nets. I looked everywhere. I can't find any nets, but it's, it served its purpose, which is to remind me. Who brings books to a library? Well, I brought a lot of books. So I brought the usual ones you'd expect. Ulysses, Finnegan's Wake, and Portrait of a Young Artist as a Young Man. It's, it's why I checked in a very large suitcase and all the tech. And so I'm just recording the sound. I'm not recording any video. But I brought two really important books. Well, one in particular important book. And this is called The Gutenberg Elegies, The Fate of Reading in an Electronic Age. And what I'm trying to do is, is figure out what does reading mean? Why would anybody read James Joyce when we've got Netflix? Well, I mean, why would you bother? But more importantly, this book was written by Sven Burkert, who some of you may know, his father designed this library. And I'll also refer occasionally to this book, The Other Walk by Sven Burkertz, because he's an essayist in, in the United States. He grew up in the United States. And uh, this is a, some very funny parts of this book, which we might come to. But first, a speech. Ladies and gentlemen, a new generation is growing up in our midst, a generation actuated by new ideas and new principles. It is serious and enthusiastic for these new ideas. And its enthusiasm, even when it is misdirected, is, I believe, in the main sincere. But we are living in a skeptical, and if I may use the phrase, a thought-tormented age. And sometimes I fear that this new generation, educated or hyper-educated as it is, will lack those qualities of humanity, of hospitality, of kindly humor, which belonged to an older day. And I think of that and I think, well, that could have come out of this book, but of course it didn't. It came out of The Dead, uh, James Joyce's first book of short stories. This is uh, Gabriel Conroy's speech. But it's, it, it's like, and I'm not gonna read every quote that you see, pop it on screen. But he's talking about living in a thought-tormented age, people who are educated or hyper-educated, and this is from about 1904, and he's worried about people lacking hospitality. I'm going to try and refer back to some of these things. And in Sven's book, The Other Walk, my childhood language has a thickness and density that I hardly ever get with English. Though I'm English over around my Latvian 50 years ago, the first spell is strongest. We speak English day-to-day. Uh, -day. That's a, the language we probably grew up with. But we speak a translated language. So we would have spoken Irish originally, all our ancestors, or most of, certainly all of my ancestors spoke Irish. And then we began to speak English, but we speak English with Irish idioms, Irish ways of speaking. And so often authors like Joyce, Shaw, Beckett, I could keep going on, wild, they speak and they, they write in a language that is not their original. It is what they started speaking from birth, but the way they speak it is different. And sometimes that is why we're popular. So I thought that was a 
quite our citizens. So we'll talk a little about the Joyce lad. Who was he? Where did he live? And what did he write about? So that's the, essentially, and we'll try and do that. Who was he? Indeed. Well, he was born in this house in what's called Brighton Square in Dublin. He was born on the 2nd of February, 1882. For any of you who like American movies, you might know this as Groundhog Day. And he's born in this house in Brighton Square in Dublin. It's actually a triangle, but we won't fess on that. He died on the 13th of January, 1941 in Zurich, Switzerland. This is his grave at the Fluntern Cemetery. Well, well worth going to see if you're in Zurich. It's, a, it's really moving. Where did he live? Okay, so he lived all over the place. Now, he was constantly on the move. I don't know what was wrong with the man, but he couldn't sit still. <laughs> yeah, he, he was born in Dublin. He lived in, I think it was 14 or, or 18 different houses before he left. I've been to all of them. He went to Pola in Austria. He went to Trieste, which was then in Austria. He went then to Roma in Italy. He went back to Trieste in Austria. He went to Zurich in Switzerland. He went off to Paris for a long period of time, and he then went back to Zurich. And he sheltered in the two world wars, as, as I know, in the, the Second World War in Ireland would have been known as the emergency, but he sheltered in Zurich. What did he write? When he wrote Dubliners, a novel of short story, or a book of short stories, and one of the things about Joyce's work is it was all serialized. So although the first book is a book of short stories, and he also wrote some poetry and some, pro, some prose and some criticism and all sorts of other things. But he's known for these four main books, which are down here. But Dubliners is a book of short stories. Largely, it's about stasis in Ireland at around the turn of the century, the previous century, about the early 1900s, when not much was happening in Ireland. And when you read the stories first, it's hard to know what is, what is really going on. It's regarded as one of the greatest books of short stories written between 1904 and 1909. He then wrote The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, which is a coming of age novel, a building from man. And it's about a, a man called Stephen Dedalus and largely how Stephen grows up in Ireland and then leaves. We'll come back to Stephen many times. And written in Dublin, and Trieste, 1904 to 1914. And so what you can see is he's not very quick at writing this fella. He takes his time. That's his, his next book. He then writes Ulysses, probably all heard of Ulysses. So he writes that in Trieste, and these are all copied from the back of the book. Trieste, Zurich, Paris, 1914 to 1921. So this one takes him a long time to, to get through, but he's, he's not done. He's got one more book left. So this is the book of the day. So this is all about uh, two people moving throughout Dublin throughout the day in separate journeys and finally meeting. And then they, um, Leopold Bloom, it's St Stephen Dedalus, who appears in A Portrait of the Art as a Young Man, and Leopold Bloom go walking through Dublin, gets to the end of the night. Bloom goes to sleep with his wife, Molly Bloom. Stephen goes off, nobody knows where. And the day ends at two o'clock in the morning. Molly takes over then and, and narrates the most wonderful chapter. Uh, and then the book ends. And then Finnegan's Wake. So Finnegan's Wake is a very difficult book to read. I won't, <laughs> I won't lie. This is, this, is, this is a tricky one to read. Ulysses I find very easy. This, this, is, this is tricky enough. But Finnegan's Wake was written in between Paris between 1922 and 1939. It took him rather a long time to, to finish Finnegan's Wake and uh, he died not long afterwards. It is the book of the night and it's a book about dreaming. So the language in it is very different and you'll see some of the language. But it's about dreaming. So you've got Ulysses is the book of the day. And then you got the Book of the Night. And one of the things that Joyce didn't do was repeat himself. He didn't write a book of short stories think, oh, that was good, I'll write another one. He sort of changed everything each time. And if you've written Ulysses, it's hard to follow it on. Typically, people who read a lot of Joyce, I think, there's those who really love Finnegan's Wake, and there's those who really love Ulysses. I would be the, the Ulysses type. What did he write about? So apart from everything that you could possibly imagine, nothing much happens in Ulysses. This is probably my favorite quote about Ulysses. Um, there's every single thing you could imagine in Ulysses. Everything you do during the entire day, and I mean everything, uh, is in there. And all the things you might think about during the day are in there. And this is a quote by Anne Enright, uh, an Irish author, contemporary author, and she's writing in The Guardian. But I think that is, uh, yeah, it's a brilliant quote. Reading Joyce. A couple of tricks to learning to read Joyce. When I go around in Ar Ireland and talk amongst my friends, you know, a lot of people say, ah, Joyce, you know, it's just hard. You know, there's a few keys to learning to read Joyce. Now, warning, adult content ahead. This is a picture from, I think it's Ventspils, it's the nudist beach. I haven't been there, I will point out. I got a picture off the internet and, and uh, reframed it. And, and I've, been, I've been preparing the lecture for a long time and looking at Joyce books for, for a long time. And I can't unsee James Joyce in this. <laughs> I just can't unsee it. And hopefully when you're next down in the beach, maybe you won't unsee it. But, but the point is there are adult themes ahead. I'm not going to go too much into the adult themes, but they're there. 
Joyce wrote at a time when there was little radio and no television. So radio in Ireland, RT is our national broadcaster, Radio Television, and they started broadcasting radio in 1926 and television in 1961. So Joyce wrote for people who read a lot of books, not like ourselves, we've got so many competing interests. He wrote to Harriet Shaw Weaver. Now the thing about Joyce, one of the things that was amazing about him was he had a huge amount of female benefactors, absolutely extraordinary. Harriet Shaw Weaver seems to have almost dedicated her, her entire inheritance to James Joyce, and he sucked money up like nobody else. But he wrote to her to try and talk about his, uh, his writing. One great part of every human existence is passed in a state which cannot be rendered sensible by the use of wide awake language, cut and dry grammar, and go ahead plot. So he wasn't interested in those things. So when you read a Joyce book, you think, well, what was that about then? Um, that's not necessarily what's about. If you want plot, you know, read an Agatha Christie mystery, the, the Murder of Roger Ackroyd, an absolutely wonderful book. That has a lot of plot. There isn't much plot in James Joyce. Rather than write a mo novel for a million years, Joyce said he preferred to write novels that one person would read a million times. So all of these books down here are designed to be read many times. This is from uh, this book. Sven puts it well. I spent long months in college and after trying to make the measure of Joyce's Ulysses. Limited as I was in both experience and learning, I naturally fell short. But so intense was my application that I managed to internalize much of the book. And now, unexpectedly, as if governed by some time-release chemical, lines and passages flash their sense to me. I pick up a reference. I grasp the real point of a joke or a pun. I see in some larger way what Joyce is getting at. The once nearly unscalable wall of language has come down. The book is now more like some vast honeycomb stacked with corridors, mainly accessible. I've done nothing except grow more slowly out of some of my ignorance. I mean, I think that's just, it's, that's what it is. You read Joyce and then it seeps in and some bits you start to understand way later. And that, I mean, having read all these and I read them pretty <laughs> much all the time, there's still stuff every day, there's new stuff, every single time. When I was pacing up down here earlier, new stuff I just read and I say, oh, that's what that's about. And he'd also listen to Dead. I approached the story like a difficult piece of music, first acquainting myself with the structure and then listening further for the tonal, textual and harmonic subtleties. And truly, with a writer like Joyce, language can make a kind of music, with vowels and consonants and rhythmic shifts piping an intricate accompaniment to the other senses. Now he, James Joyce was a wonderful singer. He uh, came third in the Fesh Kjol. Um, and if he had not had very terrible eyesight, because uh, he couldn't actually read, he couldn't see what he was supposed to be singing, people reckon he would have won. But he was a brilliant singer, and a lot of his work is, is, is designed to be read out loud. And when you read it out loud, it, it's great. Declan Kyber wrote a book, Ulysses and Us. If you see it in bookshops, it's got a cover. The picture cover is, uh, is uh, Marilyn Monroe reading Ulysses. My father loved Ulysses as the fullest account ever given to the city in which he lived. And that's a key to what I'm interested in, Joyce. It's the fullest account of the city in which he lived. These, there are parts that baffled or boredom, and these he skipped. Much as today, we fast forward over the duller tracks on beloved music albums, but there were entire passages which he knew almost by heart. So when I pick up Ulysses, you know, if I want to read it from start to finish, as I do sometimes, I often don't have time, I don't have time to read it because I'm so, so busy studying it. Um, so I don't have time to actually, so I'm dipping in and out all the time. But I'll start reading a couple of chapters and I think, oh God, I've got to get through the next chapter. And then I'll, I'll, look, I'll be the chapter I really like. And that's, that's, that's quite common. Those chapters and what you like might skip. So don't worry about the bits in Ulysses or in James Joyce's work that you don't understand. Think about the bits that you do and get the joy out of those. This is, from, this is a quote from a kid's book. Developing readers can be concentrating so hard on the words, they sometimes don't fully grasp the meaning of what they're reading. So sometimes kids, they can only get, it's the words or the meaning, they can't get both. And certainly when I read Finnegan's Wake, I, I had to make that choice. Um, and uh, yeah, I could only get the words like, or the meaning, I couldn't get both, so I chose the words. On writing, so he said, of, James Joyce said a variety of interesting things about his writing. He's writing to Ezra Pound from Zurich. Perhaps there is something, if only I could think of it. Unfortunately, I have very little imagination. Now for a man who's regarded as having a great imagination, I'm quite content to go down in posterity as a citizen paste man, for that seems to me a harsh, but not unjust description. I once broached, this is, there's a guy called Budgeon who writes some great books, he was a friend of Joyce's. I once broached the question of imagination with Joyce. He brushed it aside with the assertion that imagination was memory. He believes nature, chance or something provides him with illustrative incidents for what he's writing. I'll give you some examples in a while. Why should I regret my talent? I haven't any. I write with such difficulty, so slowly. Chance furnishes me with what I need. I'm like a man who stumbles along, my foot strikes something, I bend over and that is exactly what I want. So the city. So this is the city of Dublin. 
uh, there's a little, the River Liffey runs east-west and then there's a bay with beaches either side. There's host to the north and um, Dunleary down to the south. Every single part of this map, which is from Apple Maps or whatever, I live in the, where the blue, blue dot is, Joyce writes about, walks through. I, w I went out for some light relief. I thought, I, I need to go out to, with my friend to a pub. I got to the pub and I'm sitting in a pub opposite Sweeney's and thinking, Oh, crikey, I've come to a pub mentioned in Ulysses. So, <laughs> it's great, it's Conway's, uh, or now called Kennedy's. I once said Joyce, as we were walking down the University of that Strasse, to give a picture of Dublin so complete that if one day suddenly, it suddenly disappeared from Earth, it could be reconstructed out of my book. Well, it couldn't. There's very little description of Dublin in, in, in uh, Ulysses. For myself, Joyce answered, I always write about Dublin because if I can get to the heart of Dublin, I can get to the heart of all cities in the world. In the particular is contained the universal. And what he's getting at is that you could be out in Latvia, in Riga, and, and what some of the things that he's writing about a city that you haven't been to may relate to experiences you have here. And that's what he's, that's what he's kind of getting at. This is a long quote by Anthony Burgess, who wrote Clockwork Oranges, but I'll only read parts. Joyce's books are all about Dublin, all of them. But we're wrong if we think that Dublin encloses the work of Joyce, that a knowledge of the city is the key to understanding. Dublin and Joyce is turned into an archetypal city, eventually into a dream city. It helps us to know something about Dublin, the real city of Joyce's memory. When we tackle the myths, he is made out of it, but it is by no means essential. The real keys to an understanding of Joyce are given to the diligent reader, not the purchaser of an Aer Lingus ticket. Aer Lingus is the Irish airline. You don't have to go to Dublin to get great enjoyment out of Joyce. I fully recommend it, by the way. This is from Invisible Cities by Itala Calvino. In vain, great-hearted Kublai, shall I attempt to describe Zyra, the city of high bastions. I could tell you how many steps make up the streets, rising like stairways and the degree of the arcade's curves, and what kind of zinc scales over the roofs, but I already know this would be the same as telling you nothing. The city does not consist of this, but of relationships between the measurements of its space and the events of its past, the height of a lamppost and the distance from the ground of a hanged usurper's swaying feet, the line strung from the lamppost to the railing opposite, and the festoons that decorate the course of the Queen's nuptial procession, the height of that railing and the leap of the adulterer who climbed over it at dawn. So it's about relationships between place and time. It's uh, not necessarily the individual descriptions. Cork. James Joyce was from Dublin, but his father was from Cork. And everybody thinks James Joyce, he's a very serious writer, but he was, in lots of ways, he liked simple jokes. He describes Ulysses as a comic novel. Some of you might find that hard to believe. I don't. I find it very amusing. By way of example, he lives in uh, his apartment in, in, in France. He invites Frank O'Connor, who's from Cork, and when Frank O'Connor gets into James Joyce's hall, he looks at a picture, and on the, it's a picture of Cork, the River Lee, and Joyce points at it and says to Frank O'Connor, it's Cork. And, and Frank O'Connor says, I know it's Cork, I'm from Cork. And he says, no, 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 the frame, it's Cork. So he'd made the frame out of Cork, which you'd get in the top of a wine bottle. So he thought that this was a great joke, and Frank O'Connor said, this Joycean joke, claimed O'Connor, left him feeling dizzy. It struck me, he wrote, that the man was suffering slightly from association mania. Um, now, some people like that kind of thing. I'm, I'm certainly one of them. But he, Joyce associated all sorts of things together. And again, we'll put some things. We'll go through some of the people. Now, there are thousands of people in James Joyce's work, really thousands of them. But uh, James Joyce, this is him without his glasses, taken in uh, at Dublin by his friend, Constantine Curran. But in Joyce's work, he primarily introduces himself as Stephen Dedalus. He's in the book, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and in Ulysses. And there are parallels. Stephen Dedalus is not James Joyce, but the parallels of where they grew up and how they grew up. So James Joyce uses him as a vehicle to express the younger man. He's rather, rather serious. He's also, James Joyce is also in part Leopold Bloom. We'll come to that later. One of um, the most famous quotes of uh, Stephen Dedalus is, am I walking into eternity along Sandy Mount Strand? And I'll show you pictures of Sandy Mount Strand in Dublin, near where I live. This is Nora Barnacle, otherwise known as Molly Bloom. So this is Nora Barnacle as James Joyce's wife. And um, it's a picture of her biography by Brenda Maddox. And she's Molly Bloom in the novel Ulysses. And this is the ending of the Ulysses, and I thought, well, as him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I say yes, to say yes, my mountain flower. And first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said, w yes, I will, yes. It's a really famous ending to the book. Most critics think this is, she's thinking of, 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 she's saying yes to Leopold Bloom. I don't actually think she's uh, saying yes to Leopold Bloom. I think she's saying yes to Mulvey back in Gibraltar, but... Be that as it may. Um, this is some of the, so in the last uh, chapter of Ulysses, I think there's only six sentences and it's 40 or 50 pages long. And she talks like this, oh, oh, it's fantastic. 
Uh, this is James Joyce's father, John Stanislaus, Stanislaus Joyce, also known as Simon Dedalus. And uh, Joyce said he was a silly, after he died, he was the silliest man I knew, and yet cruelly shrewd. He thought and talked me up to his last breath. I was fond of him always being a sinner myself, uh, and even liked his faults. Hundreds of pages and scores of characters in my books come from his dry or rather wet wit, and his expression of face convulsed me often with laughter. He loved his father, even though he didn't see him. He, he, was, he didn't, from 1904 till when he died in 1939, I think he, he visited Dublin twice. He wrote often. So this is Stephen, uh, a.k.a. the young James Joyce, writing about his father. He was a medical student, an oarsman, a tenor, an amateur actor, a shouting politician, a small landlord, a small investor, a drinker, a good fellow, a storyteller, someone's secretary, something in a distillery, a tax gatherer, a bankrupt, and at present, a praiser of his own past. And, and because Stephen Dedalus is, is writing these things and they, they parallel Joyce's father, we get to see more and more of, of Joyce and what he was trying to get at. This is one of his father's famous quotes, agonizing Christ wouldn't give you a heartburn on your arse. Now, I expect not all of you speak great English. It is, I don't know how anyone's going to translate this into different languages, but uh, I understand Ulysses has been translated by Latvian and it's going to be translated again. So yeah, one of his father's favorite things. I write a, a running blog related to James Joyce. And in Dubliners, there's this phrase, little Chandler quickened his pace. For the first time in his life, he felt himself superior to the people he passed. For the first time, his soul revolted against the dull inelegance of Capel Street. Now, Capel Street, uh, the jo Joyce is writing in 1904. I started studying in the School of Architecture in 1980. Capel Street is, adjoins the School of Architecture. And uh, in 2014, when I started my JJ21K project, it, it looked dull and inelegant, and it was dull and inelegant in the 1980s. It's changed a little bit now. This was it a couple of Sundays ago. It actually looks, I mean, surprisingly good in this picture with the, the sun over, over um, City Hall. But, yeah, I found it dull and inelegant. And I was thinking, well, do cities change that fast? And particularly when you're studying architecture, you think, I'm going to change loads of cities. And it doesn't really happen. Um, they don't change all that much. So I wanted to then compare the Dublin of today to the Dublin of the past, because in, in Ulysses in particular, in around 1904, Joyce writes comprehensively about the city, how people spoke, what they did. And because in Ulysses, everything is on, on show in Ulysses, you get an idea of that. So that's what I wanted to do, to discover Dublin by reading and running, kind of that you'd be in a bit and out a bit, that kind of thing. Where Joyce lived and the people he knew influenced his work. This is sort of central to some of the things that I try and do. I, I, I even find it hard to believe I do this. But I've turned James Lo jo Joyce's life into a spreadsheet. So, <laughs> So I won't go through in any great detail other than to say I've taken every month of his life going out horizontally and I've tracked down exactly where he lived. So that's all down here. I haven't even got to the bottom of everywhere he lived, everything he wrote and everything that was published because I can then pick where he was when he wrote what it was and then see what relates. And we'll, we'll come to an example of that. It's a strange pastime I know. Running. I do a lot of running. Haruki Murakami, I saw some of his books translated into Latvian this afternoon. I went to a bookstop. What I talk about when I talk about running. So this is, for people who run, this is a really famous book. Uh, so I never go, never go running without thinking about what I'm going to think about when I go running. I don't, I don't just randomly go out. I'm, I've got a plan of what I'm going to think about when I'm out running. I won't lie, for the last couple of weeks, it's about making this lecture. So I do that. So at any rate, that's how I started running. 33, that's how old I was then. Still young enough, though no longer a young man. That was the age when I began my life as a runner. And it was my belated but real starting point as a novelist. Murakami, he relates the two together. Running is a great activity to do while memorizing a speech. As almost unconsciously I move my legs, I line up the words up in the order my, in my mind. Sometimes when I'm practicing speech in my head, I catch myself making all sorts of gestures and facial expressions. And people pass me from the opposite direction, give me a weird look. Well, I got some of those yesterday uh, when I was out running, because that's exactly, I'm lining up slides. I'm thinking, I'm going to laugh at you. What on earth am I going to talk about? And, and I, don't, I can't do that at home. I go out, step out the door, uh, run down to Sandy Mount Strand, run around, run back. And then I think, right, that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, this is, this is my favorite quote. <laughs> it's from, uh, again, from Sven Burkert's book. We don't shut ourselves off and turn the book on. We're never that silent or submissive. Our own sub-threshold murmuring continues. At times we find the two voices, ours and the author's, in dissonant parley. John is confessing his love for Maria, and we are simultaneously wondering if the back tire in our car is leaking. If John and Maria fade any further, we may get up to go to the garage. I was kind of thinking this and thinking, gosh, they're sitting there with my lecture, and someone's thinking, did I feed the parking meter, or did I, did I leave the dog in the back garden, or did I leave the immersion on if you're in Ireland? We're always with books. You can be in and you can be out of them. And, and, uh, you see, actually, even in Joyce's writings, there's a lot of these overlappings. But I think that's one of the things. And 
I mentioned earlier Joyce had a great singing voice. This is, uh, so if you went, wanted to listen to Ulysses, it's 22 CDs in the unabridged version. I totally recommend do not ever listen to Joyce abridged. I didn't realize I was listening to a bridged portion of the young man until after I listened to it a few times. It throws you off and, and people have to make judgments and it's not the authors. I wouldn't recommend that. And if you do want to listen to Joyce, and I really do, then Ulysses, read by Jim Norton with Marcella Reardon playing the part of Molly Bloom is fantastic. Jim Norton is famously known in Ireland as Bishop Brennan. For those of you who have seen Father Ted, he is from, he's famous from Father Ted, so, um, but he's a absolutely, if you want to listen to Joyce, this is the one I recommend, and he's done a portrait of the artist, and he's done Dubliners. Blog post. To give you an idea of some of the things that I do in relation to what I'm doing with Joyce, I run around, and early on I did simple ones, like the smells of Dublin, the sounds of Dublin, all these kinds of things. And this one, I'm going to try and unpick this one, try and make a bit of sense. So this is from Ulysses, and, and you might be looking at this thinking, what on earth is going on? Sea bloom, grease of bloom, viewed last words softly when my country takes a place along. What on earth is going on? Okay. Now, the thing with Ulysses and with most of James Joyce is you need a little in. And once you've got the in, this all makes perfect, at least it makes perfect sense to me, and it might make perfect sense to, your, uh, to, to, to many Irish people. So we had a patriot called Robert Emmett. He was executed, and his famous last speech from the dock is in italics here, and it's in italics in the book. When my country takes her place among nations of the earth, then and not till then, let my epitaph be written, I have done. Now, that's a very, very famous Irish speech. So here we have Bloom has come out of the pub in the afternoon. He doesn't know. He's been drinking cider, and earlier on he had burgundy. And he decides that it would be a good idea to break wind. Okay, so he wants to, but, but, so he wants to do this. And so the purr, purr, purr must be the bird. This is all his, 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 his inner organs are going out. Of, but at the same time, he's thinking of Robert Emmett. Now, so he's doing this. So he's thinking, so Robert Emmett, so softly when my country takes her place among, brr, must be the bird, nations of the earth, known behind. And then she's passed. So you think, so this is, he's seen a, uh, a prostitute coming along that he thinks he recognizes from a, lane, from a laneway. He may or may not have had an assignation with her. So he decides to turn and look in the window. As he decides to turn in the window, a tram starts coming. So that's the tram, cran, cran, good opportunity coming, cran, glan, cran, cran. I'm sure it's the burgundy. Yes, one, two, let my epitaph be written, I have done. The point, there's so much in just one short piece. It's a huge piece of Irish history. This is just one tiny piece of a very large book. And it's why it's so fun for some, the more you read it, the more you understand of it. And that's one of the things that's, I always say it's the gift to keep on giving. Giddies is good for you. This is much more simple. But this is from Finnegan's Wake, and it's very hard to understand what's going on here. And I don't understand what, all of what's going on. But essentially, there's somebody talking, one eye gone black. Bison's is bison's. Now, what that is, is business is business. Why it's bison's, I'm not totally sure. Um, it's something to do, obviously, with animals. Let me, for all your hesitancy, cross your crown with a drink of guilt. Here, have silver coil, a piece of oak. Guineas is good for you. Now, for those of you who know Ireland even moderately well, everybody will have heard of Guinness. It's, a, it's our probably, probably a serious national export. It's a, it's a big drink. My father worked for Guinness. But Guinness was good for, is good for you is, is, has been the catchphrase of Guinness for a very long period of time. But Guineas are a form of payment. And in this, he's saying Guineas is good for you, but also Guinness is good for you. He's using an advertising slogan and putting multiple meanings. Now, there are 40 different identified languages in Finnegan's wake. Latvian isn't one of them. I'm sorry to tell you all. Um, I think Lithuanian might. I'm not, I'm not a linguist, but I think I read it was. But either way, um, there's, and, and there is so much in Finnegan's wake, and you're all welcome to thumb through it. You might find a piece in there somewhere. But, but he, James Joyce loved puns, visual and verbal. My dark blue rain-drenched flower. Now, I'm not going to read all of the next quote, but you can read to your heart's content. It's from, I'll re read some of it. It's a letter to his wife. And I'm only going to, this is the, this is the censored version of the letter he has written to his wife. This is the, the clean, this is as clean as it gets. Now, there's nothing in this letter to his wife that, that he leaves nothing to the imagination. Nor my faithful darling, my sweet-eyed blackguard schoolgirl, on, on he goes to be my whore by my mistress. You can read it all there. You are always my beautiful wildflower of the hedges, my dark blue rain 
drenched flower. I mean, it's such a beautiful description. In amongst all the other stuff. When you read the letter, he starts off, and he has been you know, doing this in Dublin, and then he launches into this stuff. And then, anyway. The thing is, he's gone back to Dublin to set up a cinema, the Volta Cinema, in, in Mary Street, the first cinema in Ireland. And he's worried that his wife has, uh, so Nora Barnacle, who his, his life partner, has got a couple of kids with her at this stage. He's back in, or one kid, and he's back in Dublin. And his friend says that on the nights that James Joyce met his wife, uh, on the other nights, he was out with her. And so Joyce begins to worry, is he really the father of his own son? So this is starting to, to portray him. So he's going mad. He's in 44 Fontenoy Street with his dad. And he's, 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 he's going through these rages. And back in those times, you could write several times a day. So he's writing several times to, to, Nora, to Nora Barnacle. She's in Trieste, I think, at this stage. So he's writing back, backwards and forwards. And you can see this sense of paranoia when you read the letter. He goes around to his friend's house, a guy called J.F. Byrne, John Francis Byrne. And he lives at 7 Eccles Street. And Joyce goes around to 7, Seven Eccles Street and discovers that Byrne says, ah, Cosgrave, is, he's, not, he's, not, uh, he's never been with, with your wife. You're all imagining it. And you think, OK, so the guy goes around to a house, 7 Eccles Street, and he discovers in this very house in Dublin, it's, it's, it's no longer a house, he, he goes into this, this, this house. And in this very house, he's told his wife isn't, hasn't been unfaithful to him or sleeping with his friend Cosgrave. And he then decides to set Ulysses as in 7 Echo Street as the home of the couple in this book. And, and he decides that Molly Bloom, who's based on his wife, is going to have, uh, he's going to be a cuckold, she's going to have sex with another man at half four in the afternoon. And you think, what's going on in this guy's head? He, he sets the very thing that he thinks he's told didn't happen, he sets this in this same house. So he does some very odd things, does, does Joyce. Early on in Ulysses, um, Bloom says, good puzzle will be crossed Dublin without passing a pub. Many people tried to find a, a, a way of crossing Dublin without passing a pub. A computer programmer did it a couple of years ago. And I thought, ah, I'll give it a go. So this is the house on the north side of Dublin. James Joyce lived in several houses on the north side in Dublin. We won't go through the north side, south side thing in Dublin, it's a, but rest assured, it's a big thing. This is the only house on the north side of Dublin that has a James Joyce plaque on it, even though he lived in, in several. Every single house on the south side of Dublin, which is seen as more prosperous, has a James Joyce plaque that he lived in. Anyway, good puzzle to be crossed, Dublin without passing a pub. So I went from this pub, or from this house, which is in uh, Fibsborough or Cabra, depending on your point of view, and uh, down to where he moved. He moved from this house to another house, and it is technically possible to cross without passing a pub. And on this journey, somebody said, famously said, that a good way to cross Dublin without passing a pub is simply to go into all of them. So next thing I did one about going into all of them. So I went to every single pub in Dublin that was listed in Ulysses, the ones that were left and the ones that were not left. There's 33 of them scattered throughout uh, Dublin. So I, I made it my business to go to every single one that was left. And then I wrote a big, long blog post about that. The blog post started to get more complicated. I then wrote for the National, uh, for RTE, the, the, the broadcaster, finding the most authentic Joyce pub for Bloomsday. If anyone's wondering, it's this one. It's Mulligan's. Uh, so just in case you're ever in Dublin, you want to find an authentic J Joyce pub, it's this one. So I decided to turn all the works into half Martins, and I don't know why I decided to do this, but I decided that it would be a really good idea to turn Joyce's four major novels into half Martins. Ulysses opens in, we'll come back to Ulysses and the half Martin more, but Ulysses opens here in Sandy Cove. So the Joyce Tower is the, the top piece of, up there. That's where it's now a museum to James Joyce. But originally it was, it was actually a, a, a gun emplacement and then it was a private house and Joyce lived there for a time. He sets the opening of Ulysses and there were stately plump Buck Mulligan comes from the stairhead. So I started there. And then I ended up in a place called Glasnevin Cemetery, which is the furthest place on the north side where action takes place in uh, Ulysses. This is actually the, the, the grave of, of his parents in Glasnevin Cemetery. It's a very famous cemetery. There's at least a million people are under the ground in Glasnevin Cemetery. People used to say there was more people under the ground in Glasnevin than walking up and around Dublin. It's changed slightly since, but yeah, it's a very famous cemetery. His parents' grave there. Dubliners, I decided to do, which is a book of short stories, and I tried to figure out some theme between them. And in, in Dubliners, the, the narrative all moves to the west. It ends with the dead. My favorite story in, in Dubliners is, is a, a painful case where Mrs. Sinico uh, dies, but she's hit by a train right here. Um, there's a crossing. I wasn't standing in the middle of an open railway track, so there's actually a crossing at the time. Um, and so I decided to do that with Dubliners. And it ends up at the Phoenix Park. So this is the Wellington Monument in the Phoenix Park. And this is a portrait of the artist of the young man. So this is a park in Black Rock. This is badly taken. I'm better at this now. But I was just doing this with my iPhone just for the sake of it. But James Joyce ran in this park. 
So he actually was a very good runner. He was a brilliant swimmer. And uh, he trained right down, down here. You actually see a train coming around. But right down here at the corner in a portrait of a artist as a young man, he's riding with his private trainer. So at some point in time, I'm going to make a, an essay about James Joyce and the myth of poverty. Because there's a view, he, he, they, he started, they were very well off. They descended into poverty. We we'll go on and it ends out at the Bull Wall on the other side of Dublin. Finnegan's Wake is the most complicated book to try and do to read, but it's a very easy one to do a half marathon for because it opens with River Run by Even Adam, by Even Adams Pass, by Swear of Shore and Bend of Bay brings us by commodious vicus of recirculation to Hoth Castle and Environs. So River Run is the River Liffey, Even Adams is Adam and Eve's church along the quays in the centre of Dublin. By Swear of Shore and Bend of Bay will bring you out towards Hoth and to Hoth Castle and Environs. So I decided to do that. And so this is the view out, and, and Dublin's on the coast, so this is the view halfway over on, 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 on the hill on the way to, to the mountain. And one of the great things about the half marathon going to Finnegan's Wake is Finnegan's Wake wraps around itself. So the last sentence becomes the, the first sentence. So alone, along, alas, the river run. Uh, so it wraps around itself. And so if you wanted to do a full marathon, you'd simply run back. I haven't done that one yet. It's a, it's a bit of a hill. So then I, uh, I transferred my, my early blog posts into creating a website. If you were to open a website, it looks like this. So a bit about, a bit about reading things, uh, books that I've read, and then a bit about, uh, these are all these various different books that I've read a lot of books about Joyce, so some of this. And then there's some about reading, and then there's some about writing. So these are our various blog posts about the, the runs and different things I'm writing about. And Mr. Joyce's Ulysses, uh, Running Cork, uh, and then these are all about running, just bits and pieces about running and, and, and some sort of stuff. There are pictures of, of running around various parks. And then there are routes. So I'm creating these routes that, that people can run through Dublin, through these various areas. And then I think last is, is just something about some, some research, which is simply some of the academic papers that I'm delivering. So there's some of that. The Ulysses one. So it starts, so again, as I said, it starts down to Leary and it goes through the city centre. But I decided that it wouldn't, it would be a really good idea to not just have a race. So if you're running a race, you think, well, who would, wi who would win this 21 kilometer race? So I decided to turn it into a game. This is Ireland, probably Ireland's most famous athlete, Sonia O'Sullivan, an athlete from Cork. And I decided, well, it wouldn't be Sonia who might win it. I don't know whether Sonia O'Sullivan reads. And it might not be David Norris, who's a very famous Joyce, and who's probably in his late 70s now. Uh, so I decided, well, it wouldn't be someone who's just an athlete. It wouldn't be someone who's just knew a lot about Joyce but rather be someone who, you know, read a bit and then somebody who ran a bit, you know, somebody, well, like me. So I decided to create some sort of bizarre handicap. And I, and I have no idea why I did this, but anyway, I decided to do this. And I decided that there'd be 21 questions in this Ulysses quiz. So one for every kilometer. Then I decided that there'd be easy questions. And if you can answer an easy question, you get a minute off your time. And if you answered a hard question, you get three minutes off your time. So the idea would be that somebody who had, had fast finishing time, they would get some points if they could answer some questions. And the idea would be that we would, we would run and then we'd go to the pub and have a quiz and we'd have a bit of fun. And now I've done the run several times, but I've never actually had the, had the pub quiz. But if anyone's game, sometimes dumb. But I decided to do that. And then I, I decided, what's an easy question? So the, the questions are linked to the run. So what is Bloom's first name? Well, most people would know that Bloom's first name is Leopold. So we'll all assume that you all know it's Leopold. What is Bloom's second name? Now, I would be surprised if anybody here knows what Bloom's second name is. I would be even surprised if I asked you to all guess. Anyway, Bloom's second name was Paula. And Bloom's second name is Paula because James Joyce, there was an, um, an error on his birth cert, and he was James Augusta Joyce rather than Augustine. And so he decided, anyway, he's named Paula. So that would be the hard, so I'd give you an idea of the questions. And then I decided that I knew that I had run in 1990. This was years after I'd done this. I suddenly said, oh, I used to run. And I decided to do some math. I decided to use my own formula, and I took a guess. At the, my time when I was younger was 88 minutes. My time when I was older was blah, blah, 139. I decided that when I was younger, I could answer 11 easy questions because I'd read Ulysses and I knew blue, you know. And then I decided that because I'd said all the questions, I could answer all the hard ones. So, I just, so anyway, I did this little math to just try and see. And I discovered that my older self beat my younger self by a minute. Now, it all depends on how you balance this out. But the, the point of it all is, is really that when you get older, you, uh, you gain knowledge. And when you get older, you lose speed. And there's some sort of point in between. And so when as I look out at the statue out there, the, the sculpture of the, 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 the bench and the two people sitting on it, and I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, there's a growth of knowledge. Um, 
but there is also the slowing down. And that is largely, ironically enough, one of the things that Ulysses is about. So let's talk about Bloom and Stephen. I just got a letter asking me why I don't give Bloom a rest. The writer of it wants more Stephen. But Stephen no longer interests me to the same extent. He has a shape that can't be changed. Now, Stephen is the young James Joyce. Bloom is the older James Joyce. He's 38. It used to be when he did seem old, but not now he doesn't seem so old. But anyway, Bloom is 38, Stephen, and Stephen is a bit too serious. He's, 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 he takes himself too seriously. He's a cultured all around man, Bloom is. He said, seriously, he's not one of your common or garden. You know, there's a touch of the artist about old Bloom. And this is, that's the trick. So the, the earlier book is a portrait of the artist as a young man. Bloom is the artist as an old man. This is the run, so I start in one place and run around to the other. Portrait of the artist as a young man. So this is, uh, this is Dublin. This is, uh, this is the wooden bridge in Clontarf, for those of you who've, who haven't been to Dublin. And Joyce goes out, or Stephen Dedalus goes out this bridge. And he sees some boys swimming in the River Liffey. And there's a phrase, a boost Stephen Numinous. And again, I was running out and I saw these and I thought, oh Lord, they're in the river. And this is, uh, so we'll just swing around here again. Now at this point in time, I was out racing my nephew, but uh, so you'll see him in my shadows, some are popping up here. But to the right here, and just, just over there is a place called Cock Lake. And that's where James Joyce, or Stephen Dedalus has an apparition. A girl stood before him in midstream, alone and still gazing out to sea. She seemed like one whom magic had changed into lightness of a strange and beautiful seabird. Her long, slender bare legs were delicate as cranes and pure, save where an emerald trail of seaweed had fashioned itself as a sign upon her flesh. Her thighs, fuller and soft-hued as ivory, were bared almost to the hips where the white fringes of her drawers were like feathering of soft white down. Her slate-blue skirts were kilted boldly about her waist and dovetailed behind her. Her bosom was as a bird's, soft and slight, slight and soft as the breast of some dark plumaged dove, but her long hair was girlish and girlish and touched with the wonder of mortal beauty, her face. He sees this vision of this beautiful woman. She was alone and still gazing out to sea, and when she felt his presence and the worship of his eyes, her eyes turned to him in quiet sufferance of his gaze without shame or wantonness. Long, long she suffered his gaze and then quietly withdrew her eyes from his and bent him towards the stream, gently stirring the water with her foot, hither and thither. The first faint noise of gently moving water broke the silence, low and faint and whispering, faint as the bells of sleep, hither and thither, hither and thither, and a faint flame trembled on her cheek. Now the point is, she's aware of him. She, her, the worship of his eyes, her eyes turned to him in quiet sufferance of his gaze without shame or wantonness. So she's aware of him, he's aware of her. And it's all very beautiful. It's all beautifully written. Everything is lovely. She's stirring her foot hither and thither in the water. Heavenly God, cried Stephen's soul in an outburst of profane joy. So he has this beautiful reaction. So here we are. This is the young Stephen in a portrait of the artist as a young man. Pop on to Ulysses. This is Sandy Mount Strand, the famous Am I Walking Into Eternity on Sandy Mount Strand. And there's another girl on the beach in the Sandy Mount Strand. And there's another man. This time it's Leopold Bloom, the 38-year-old man. And she saw a long Roman candle going up over the trees, up, up, and in a tense hush, they were breathless with excitement as it went higher and higher, and she had to lean back more and more to look up after it, high, high, almost out of sight, and her face was suffused with a divine, an entrancing blush from straining back, and he could see her other things too. Nainsuk knickers, the fabric that caresses the skin, better than those other petty with the green four and eleven on account of being white. And she let him, and she saw him, that he saw that she saw, and he went it so high, and went out to sight a moment, and she was trembling in every limb, limb from being bent so far back that he had a full view high up above her knee, where no one ever, not even had on a swing or waiting, and wasn't ashamed, and he wasn't either to look in that immodest way like that, because he couldn't resist the sight of her wondrous, of the wondrous revealment half offered, like those skirt dancers behaving so modest before gentlemen looking, and he kept on looking, looking. So Bloom is looking. There's rockets going off, there's in, in the RDS, the Royal Dublin Society, there's a show on, and there's fireworks going off. So he's, it's late evening, his wife has, uh, he's thinking about his wife having slept with blazes boiling at half four in the afternoon. He's out on the beach, the rockets are going off, and he's, uh, there's, there's ceremonies going on in the church behind. She's aware of him, and he starts masturbating. So he's masturbating, 
and uh, the rockets are going off and she would have fain cried to him chokingly, held out her snowy slender arms to him to come, to feel his lips laid on her white brow, the cry of a young girl's love. A little strangled cry wrung from her, that cry that has rung through the ages, and then a rocket sprang and bang, shot, blind, blank, and then, oh, then the Roman candle burst and it was like a sigh of, oh, and everyone cried, oh, oh, in raptures, and it gushed out of it in a stream of rain gold hair threads, and they shed an, ah, they were all greeny, dewy stars falling with gold, and oh, so lovely, oh, so soft, sweet, soft. So there's this completely different sort of vision of a woman by the older man. Now, let's see. This is Zurich. So Joyce is not in Dublin writing this. He's in Zurich. He's in this house. And he lived in here on, on the Universitat, Universitatstrasse. And he sees out his back window Fräulein Martha Fleischmann. So he sees her out the window. According to her account, she first met him in the autumn of 1918. So this is true. Joyce and his family then living in the Universität Strasse, and she had come in Strasse, not much more than a stone's throw from each other. One evening at dusk, when she was about to enter her house, Joyce happened to pass by the door. He stopped abruptly and looked at her with an expression of such wonder in his face, I won't pronounce the German, that she hesitated for just a moment before entering the house. Joyce then apologised in German and said that he'd, she very strongly reminded him of a girl he had once seen standing on the beach in his home country. So he's written the first passage. He sees a woman in Zurich and thinks, good God, she's like the, the woman, the, the, the bird girl. So he sees this. Now his friend Frank Budgeon, somehow or other, <laughs> Joyce arranges an assignation with, with Martha Flashman and uh, asks Budgeon to help him come around to her, her flat or his flat or whatever, or whatever he's doing, he's got, or his artist studio. So B Budgeon has an art, he's a sculptor, so he's a studio. Joyce arranges some strange assignation. I agreed and Joyce hurried off to fetch Martha. He couldn't have had far to go for in a few minutes I heard steps in the yard, then on the wooden stairs and then on the wood floorboards of the passage. An unmistakable break in the rhythm. So Martha was lame. So Martha Fleischmann is lame. We'll go back to the beach. It was darker now and there were stones and bits of wood on the strand and slippy seaweed. She walked with certain quiet dignity characteristic of her, but with care and very slowly because, because Goethe McDowell was tight boots. No, she's lame, oh. Mr. Bloom watched her as she limped away. Poor girl, that's why she's left out in the shelf and others did a sprint. Thought something was wrong with her about to cut her a jib. Jilted beauty, a defect is 10 times worse than a woman, but makes them polite. Glad I didn't know it when she was on show. So he's taken this woman who has a limp. He's put her together with his early bur his, his, uh, uh, bird girl that he's seen in the earlier novels. And he writes her into the sand Van Strand. And as Stephen, the young, more serious man, his reaction of, to seeing this woman, and she's moving her foot hither and thither. So he's looking at her foot in the first novel, and now, now he sees a woman who's lame. And Stephen's reaction in the early novel is, you know, oh, heavenly God. So Bloom's reaction is, uh, hot little devil all the same. I wouldn't mind. So it's just very different, the perspectives between a middle-aged man and a younger man. And that in part is what Ulysses is about. It's the very serious young man who's overthinking everything. But the older man who's more relaxed, who's 38 years old, which happens to be the age Joyce is when he's writing this as he's sitting in Zurich. So his reflections are coming back into things. So let's talk about Bloom and Stephen in Ulysses and I am a. So Bloom and Stephen go on to the same stretch of, of beach in Dublin called Sandy Mount Strand. And it, it's self-referential. Joyce is, uh, Stephen Dedalus is based on James Joyce, and so in a way is Leopold Bloom, but one's a younger man and one's an older man. And they go on to this beach and they do various things during the day, but in the morning, Stephen Dedalus is, is walking along the strand and he says, am I walking into eternity on Sandy Mount Strand? It's a very famous quote about this. And I kind of had to say, <laughs> was reading this and then I was looking at this and this is a, uh, there's a thing called Strav Art where people go around and they leave their watches on and their various things on and they create artworks by moving around. And this guy, Jeremy Wood, flew around on Ryanair flights around, uh, around Europe. He went to Norway anyway, and he created this star. And I thought, oh, I fancy you go with that. So I decided, this is my notebook, I decided I would try and write Joyce. I thought, well, I'll, I'll run around and I'll, 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 I'll do that. And so, uh, so I thought, well, I'll run around and I'll go in straight lines and then I'm, uh, I don't teach typography, but I'm I guess I'm responsible for people who do. Um, but I was trying to, trying to see how I could, I could run without, and know where I was. I thought I was going to get dizzy and I had all these sort of things. And this is my notebook that I flick through every now and then. And then I was reading another passage in, and I'm on Sandy Mount Strand. Later in the afternoon, Mr. Bloom is, Bloom is on the strand. His wife is having a... Uh, 
an assignation, let's put it that way, with blazes boiling at half four in the afternoon. Bloom goes out onto the strand and he's feeling a bit doleful. I won't go to everything that happens on the strand, but Mr. Bloom with his, his stick gently vexed the thick sand of his foot. Write a message for her, might remain, what I? Some flat foot tramp on it in the morning, useless, washed away, tide comes here, so a pool near her foot. All this is going on, he's thinking all sorts of things, but he's got I am a. Now, he's writing with a stick into the, into the sand, I am a. He's really writing, or what's believed he's writing, because lots of things then about cuckoos, and I won't go into all the cuckoo stuff, but he's essentially writing, I am a cuckold. And a cuckold is, is, some, is a man who, whose wife has slept with another man. So he realizes that Blaze is boiling, and he knows it's going to happen. So Blaze has nipped around to see Molly Bloom in the afternoon. Bloom is out in the strand. He's dovefully he's thinking about this. It's 8 o'clock at night, and he takes this, this uh, stick, and he writes, I am a. And he writes, at the end, he says, no room, let it go. So he doesn't... He, he doesn't complete his sentence, he just, just let it go. Um, Mr. Bloom faced the letters with a slow boot, hopeless thing sand, nothing grows in it, all fades. Because he's realizing the tide will come in and wash out his I am a. Ah. This is Sandy Man Strand. Now the, po the part of Sandy Man Strand show is where, where that was written has now, is now reclaimed land. But this is Sandy Man Strand on a typical day with, uh, you know, typical day in Dublin. And so Sandy Man Strand is, is here, it runs along here, Marion Strand is down there, and this area, but part of it has been reclaimed. So it's now a public park. And so I didn't write, realize that I could write I am a. So that's got to be a lot easier than getting Joyce and going dizzy. And I thought to myself, oh, I could do I am a, yeah. And then I had this idea that I'd put out some cones. This is in 2015. I'd put out some cones and I'd write I am a, and I'd, I'd sort of run there, and then I'd run up here, then I'd run down here, and I'd run back there, and then I'd go down there. And I had this idea. I thought, I could do that. So I thought, just get a few cones and lay them out, and I can do that somewhere. And this is a, an Ordnance Survey map from 1911, and, and this is the area that Joyce is in. So uh, the, the, the start of the Sea Church, where, where this takes place, is, is, is somewhere here, and it's out the back. But that's now reclaimed land. This is a park called Seanmore Park. And this is where, funnily enough, this is the start of the Sea Church here. And right here is where this event takes place when jo um, Bloom is writing in the sand. And so I thought to myself, oh, hang on a second, I'll do it there. Right, that would be, that'd be good. I'll go out to the spot that Joyce did this, and I'll do that. And then I worked out that there was a football pitch. And I thought, right, so I'll use the football pitch to give some sort of markers for doing this largely pointless exercise. But I decided I'd do it. And uh, I, so we just ha I'm worrying about half the pitch. I thought, oh, I can do that. And, you know, I can figure a quarter of the pitch. And so I was kind of figuring this in my head. And then I was down there. I run here all the time. I mean, I'm here most nights of the week, uh, running along around it, not, not in it. And I realized there was, flood, <laughs> there was these. These are uh, flood lamps. And I thought, well, when I get halfway across the pitch, I know I'm halfway across the pitch because there are goalposts. This is a Gaelic football. This is our national sport. And we play either football or hurling. So football, we play with a ball. We kick it into net or we kick it between these bars. Or we play hurling where we, we go with sticks and a, and a small ball called a schlitter. And so this, I think I, so this is me uh, actually doing my silly run. And so I'm running along towards the first uh, post, and then I'll, I'll turn around. I've sped this up because I, uh, you know, and then I, I'm using this as the next. <laughs> Even I think this is a stupid, mad thing to do. Anyway, so I'm going across, and I'm then looking around. And anyway, so I do all this. I won't, I won't go through the whole thing. Um, but this is what it turned out. I am a. Now. Um, Ulysses, the night that Ulysses is set on the, six, the 16th of um, June 1904, Joyce was staying in this house and, on it, and the Star to Sea Church is, is, features really in, 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 in the novel. So I started to see the Star to Sea Church and went up, and I probably need to redo the A. But anyway, I went up, I did that, and I thought that was. Uh, so what did I think? So then I turned it into a blog post. Now the thing about it is, have I run into eternity upon. Sandy Mount Strand. So Joyce wanted to walk into eternity. I thought to myself, well, I've run into eternity. And one of the things that interested me about it was that Joyce, Leopold Bloom is not real. Even if he was real, what he's writing into the sand is ephemeral. It, it, it's a sort of an imagination of things, just as I am a is, a, is an imagination of things. And so I thought, well, have I run into eternity on Sandy Mount Strand?
just maybe, just maybe, this morning, in these trousers and exactly this kit, I didn't bring anything else, perhaps I've run into eternity on Leopold Strand. Let's talk a tiny bit about Ireland. This is uh, Finnegan's Wake. It's, a wor it's from Finnegan's Wake. I won't begin to try to pronounce this. James Joyce was afraid, afraid of thunder. He really was afraid of thunder. And uh, he was afraid of dogs as well. But anyway, he was afraid of thunder. And he wrote thunder words into Finnegan's Wake. This is one of them. I, I, I mentioned the 40 languages. This could be any, any language. But at, at the turn of the century in Ireland in 1904, everybody knew a thunder. Something was coming down the tracks. And Joyce was at University College Dublin. He had four friends. He had three friends. Three, well, he had loads of friends. But in a portrait of the artist, this young man, he wrote about three of them. These are household names in Ireland. Some of these people, they all have statues and things named after them. But anyway, James Joyce, he was Stephen Dedalus. George Clancy was Davin. Francis Chee Scavington was McCann. And Tom Kettle does not appear that I know of in, in, um, in a portrait of the artist as a young man. But of course, with Joyce, you, you, you never really know. So Francis Chee Scavington appeared in, in McCann as McCann. Francis Chee Skeffington was a famous pacifist in Ireland. So he chose the road of pacifism. Dedalus said McCann crisply, I believe you're a good fellow, but you've yet to learn the dignity of altruism and the responsibility of the human individual. A voice said, intellectual crackery is better out of this movement than in it. Francis Chee Skeffington was a pacifist. In the 1916, our, our famous rising, we have a, uh, a large neighbor to the east who we've had a very difficult relationship sometimes with. Uh, sometimes great, sometimes difficult. But in 1916, we had a, a, what was called the Rising, essentially uh, a, a revolution. Francis Sheehy Skeffington, living in the city, was a pacifist. He went out to uh, O'Conn Street to stop people looting from shops and or to, to try and ask them to not loot from shops. He was arrested by a sort of rogue officer from the British Army and he was murdered. So didn't work out very well for a, a, a wonderful Irishman. Thomas Kettle, he had a different plan. So he was, uh, James Joyce said about him, my good friend Kettle is he married on Wednesday and tonight I've had a conversation of four hours with him. He's the best friend I have in Ireland, I think, and he's done me great services here. He's writing to Norway before he's telling about all the other stuff. So, you know, and uh, so Kettle was a great friend of his. There's a statue in Stevens Green to Tom Kettle, I think. And uh, anyway, Tom, Tom Kettle um, decided that the way to, to Irish freedom, and they were, that's what they were all interested in, in a sense. Uh, the New Ireland Kettle, he signed up to fight for the British Army in the uh, First World War. He died at the Bottle of the Somme. That was pro Kettle. Uh, George Clancy is Davin. He's, uh, he's my favourite character in a portrait as a young man. He's a very sweet, idealistic uh, young man. Try to be one of us, repeated Davin. In your heart, well, sorry, Davin was George Clancy, who, was, who, was the, who became the mayor of Limerick. So try to be one of us, repeated Davin. In your heart, you're an Irishman, but you pro, your pride is too powerful. So this is Joyce speaking as Stephen. My ancestors threw off their language and took on another, Stephen said. They allowed a handful of foreigners to subject them. Do you fancy I'm going to pay my own life and person debts that they made? What for? For our freedom, said Davin. So Davin, who was in reality George Clancy, he was mayor of Limerick, the, probably the third biggest city in, in Ireland. And the Black and Tans, which was a regiment of the British Army, uh, came to his door, asked to see him. He went outside. Uh, they shot him, they murdered him in cold blood, and uh, that was the end of poor old Davin. Joyce, the last surviving one, took, took a completely different route. So at the end of a portrait of the artist as a young man, he says, Welcome, O life. I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. Joyce decided that by exile and by writing, that was the way to create the new Ireland. This is a quote again from this wonderful book, The Gutenberg Elegies. To be a writer was not just to produce words, books, as other professionals produce car designs or legal agreements. Rather, it was to position oneself independently at an angle to society. It was to live a different and possibly dangerous way in a service of vision. Isn't this independence, this outsider's perspective, part of what we trust a writer to supply as an intrinsic component of any book? Don't we still at some level need our dreams of writers and their mysterious art? I would contend we do, and much as I like watching Netflix, I think reading books and the endless, as I've said, the gift that keeps on giving is something really important to me. So thank you.